thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Pathways for putting this on and supporting the effort. I thank all of you for being here. So I have to say, wolves have been the most successful endangered species story that I can think of in such a short time, but it's not without tremendous challenges, and that's why we're all here. So it's nice to hear a bunch of viewpoints. I'm going to give you mine, which may be different than yours and different than your neighbors, but we all have to come to terms because wolves are coming. I started uh, wolf research in Minnesota originally in 1977. Of course, I was really precocious. I was only six years old at that time. <laughs> um, but I came out to Montana in 1979 with the appearance of the first wolf um, in the Rockies. Um, prior to that, we, as you all know, long dirty history, wolves were extirpated essentially throughout the United States by about the 1930s, except in Minnesota, where I came from. And they also extirpated wolves south of Jasper Park along the Rocky Mountains, which people aren't aware of. Canadians had a big poisoning campaign and got rid of their wolves, too. Um, a little change of attitudes came about in 1973, ESA protected wolves. Bob Ream, a uh, great visionary and my mentor, started the Wolf Ecology Project in 1973, looking through for wolves throughout Montana. If he had a cluster of sightings, he'd send a student out, and then we'd go try and see if there was wolves or not. Eventually, um, this is a very young Bruce McClellan and Joe Smith. We caught a wolf in the North Fork of the Flathead Drainage, about six miles north of Glacier Park. We put a radio collar on her, and she was the first wolf in the lower 48 outside the state of Minnesota to exist. There were no wolves here then. She was the only one. So we followed her. She was the core of my master's thesis, and she came from hundreds of miles to the north someplace in Canada. <coughs> Eventually, a three-toed male joined her. In 1982, they produced the first litter of pups. So here we have, over all those years, one wolf and then one wolf. They weren't killed. And they, they successfully began to repopulate the North Fork of the Flathead. I want to point out, how many of you, first of all, how many of you here in this room know the story of the Yellowstone wolves? OK. How many of you are aware that there was dozens of wolves in Montana naturally recurring before Yellowstone was reintroduced. Yeah, I'm surprised. Most people don't know that. So this is a little bit about that story. So the wolf recovery that we were documenting occurred through dispersal from Canada. And I always have to tell, to this day in my job, every time I give a wolf top, I have to assure people the wolves were not put here by humans. This story exists that there are these other super wolves, and they were put here by people. These wolves were not. They didn't have it easy. Um, they had some struggles in the beginning. However, eventually they reproduced again in 1985, a different female. And in 1986, they moved down into Glacier, and they've been there ever since. The first den occurred in Glacier Park. This is the actual photo of the den. We crawled into it after they were gone. So it was the first den in the western US in, in say, half of a century. It was a, it was a big story. Um, that's a picture of myself and Mike Fairchild in 1986 collaring a wolf in, in Glacier Park itself. And nothing was known about how wolves make it outside of the Midwest, basically, in the lower 48. And so we documented everything about their ecology, their biology. We did the dispersal. We, I took genetic samples. All the usual stuff that biologists do. The bottom one here is the wolf-human interactions became more and more important as time went on. Um, when I first started doing this work, I was basically a misanthropic wolf researcher, and my life was running with wolves, so to speak. And the more I've evolved in this career, now my life is turned into working with humans and trying to resolve a lot of conflicts. I work with ranchers um, and hunters daily in my job. This is a picture that Bob Ream took from the airplane of the Magic Pack in Sullivan Meadow and Glacier Park in 1987. And if you would have asked me in 1987, hey, do you ever think there's going to be 2,000 wolves in the western United States? Yeah, I'd have laughed until I was tears running down my face. But folks, that's where we're at. We've gone from one wolf to about 2,000 wolves now spread out throughout the Western United States. It, it, I can't think of a better success story. But there's prices to pay in that success story. So prior to the reintroduction in 95, 96 into Yellowstone in central Idaho, we had wolves that had spread from Glacier. They went, some went to Idaho, some went to the Nine Mile, some went to Marion. They kept spreading out through the West ahead of this wave of reintroductions. Something that is not all, maybe all that well known is there were actually two wolves that made it to Yellowstone. One was filmed and one was shot just south of Yellowstone Park in 1992. 
uh, the genetic sample showed that it was most closely related to the wolves in Nine Mile, Montana. So, I'm just saying, they were making it slowly, very slowly. And their introductions were a tremendous boon. It was so helpful um, to boost the population. So, uh-oh, I'm gonna wanna shut the thing off here. Let's see, how about this one here? Uh, how about that one? There we go. So the thing I wanna point out, <laughs> is the wolf that collared this little female wolf, wolf um, 8551 in 1987 in Glacier Park, right there. And a year and a half later, she dispersed. She dispersed north. She went past Hinton, where half of the wolves were taken for the Yellowstone Park reintroduction, Yellowstone in central Idaho. And she went almost to Fort St. John's. She went 540 miles north. If she would have gone south, she would have been about 100 miles south of Yellowstone Park. So I was really hopeful they would get there on their own, but the reintroductions definitely gave them a great uh, leg up to speed up the process. The rumor that I still have to fight all the time is that these wolves that were brought for reintroductions are uh, not native wolves. And I think we can show with our data and numerous dispersal records, wolves are huge dispersers, and it's one population from the Yukon to Yellowstone now. The Y to Y is true for wolves, just like it is in many other species. This photo is a picture of the wolf uh, paper we published long ago in 2000. Well, it goes, the data goes through 2008. It's almost 300 wolf dispersals. And you'll see uh, <laughs> they just scatter like dandelion fuzz. Um, it's time to update this map, and so you'd have to add on 10 more years of data, another 300 collared wolves, another 1,000 uncollared wolves. Now they're in California. They've been to Nevada. They made it to Arizona. Wolves will go anywhere that they can avoid getting shot, basically. This is a curve of the growth from the, the wolves, just a, a minimum count that us biologists could count. So you see way over on the left end, uh, let's see, there we go. That's Kishinina. This is up through 2017. They hit their top of their curve here about 2011. We used, up until last year, we've been counting wolves from the biologist's observations, and now we're going to a POM, a patch occupancy model. Um, and that means that wolves are counted by phone surveys of hunter harvest. So if you go online and Google our annual report for fish, wildlife, and parks, that is now how we survey wolves. So it's a long, complicated model. I'm not going to go through it, but I'll be glad to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about it. But what we're finding is with the POM model, POM is the top with the 95% confidence interval bars. It, it basically replicates the minimum counts, which are the white bars. It's just about 30% greater. The story is population stabilized in about 2011, and it's slightly declined since then, stable to slightly declining. This is the distribution of wolf packs throughout the state of Montana, and those just represent the center or centroid uh, of the packs. If you've extended the whole polygons, they'd all be run together. Any place there's forest where they can't be seen. There's a lot of Montana that's open. Wolves are not tolerated. This is an example of the, the depredations. You can read the cattle and sheep and the wolf numbers. Wolf numbers uh, were wolves killed in response to depredations. So you see they also peaked in about 2011. And since then, wildlife services has come down a little harder on depredations a little earlier. And it actually has decreased. There's a less depredations now than there used to be. I think that's also related to the fact that packs are smaller than they used to be. Some just raw numbers. If you guys like numbers, here it is. Um, so right now, as of last year, we estimate there's about 819 wolves in the state of Montana, um, 146 packs, 63 breeding pairs, and we're required by law to maintain 15 breeding pairs, and we're required by law to maintain 150 animals. So we're way over our minimum. And I think we always will be, unless there's some amazing change in, in politics and social dimensions that I, I can't even perceive, unless we go back 100 years. So, in terms of livestock depredations, it's a going concern. There were 71 animals were killed last year verified. The number of wolves killed for that was 60. And I have to point out, 71 animals, it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're that producer, it's pretty damn significant. So those problems have to be taken care of. But I'd also point out that there's 1.6 million cattle, something like that, in the state of Montana. So it's a very small percentage. Wolf recovery, okay. Mike and I may have some little differences on this, but wolves are coming to Colorado whether you let them come through natural colonization or reintroduction. They're coming. 
Um, in the state of Montana, our recovery goals were met in 2002. Um, we developed a wolf conservation and management plan uh, through a citizens advisory council, much like Colorado did, which was accepted by the US Fish and Wildlife Service as a formally recognized plan in 2004. So uh, we went forward. Um, wolves were delisted in Montana and Idaho in 2011 and in Wyoming in 2017. In Montana, it's classified not as a fur bear, not as a big game, but as a species in need of special management. It's the only animal in the state, I think, that has that classification. <laughs> Tell you how controversial it is. People don't want to step in it too deeply, and this allows a lot of flexibility. Um, hunting and trapping areas opened up in 2009 and 11, and there's been a harvest ever since. So you saw from my previous table last year, about 260 or so animals were legally harvested. We know of over, it was 300 and like 312 that were no mortalities between wildlife services control, uh, hunting and trapping. Um, the biggest thing for us as managers is we're required by law, by statute, to collar livestock packs. And basically that's kind of any pack in the state of Montana with the exception of the, la the pack up at Kentla Lake in the park. Um, that they can come into contact with livestock. Um, other than that, we don't have any other mandates. No, they're not, no research is being conducted on them. Um, and we're going to the POM system for counting wolves now. So this is kind of the fun part here. Where am I at for time? I can't see the clock up here. So I've got three and a half minutes. Perfect. Thank you. I brought my glasses up, but what the hell. So, um, something for management concerns. Natural, you have to think about if you want to natural recolonization versus reintroductions. Livestock's going to be a big issue. I can tell you from Montana right now, you need to have in place some kind of depredation control, compensation fund, way to pay for it. Most importantly, a proactive methods, range riders, flattery. There's all kinds of things that are tried and true, and they actually do help keep down the number of livestock. Other big thing, and especially in my area in northwest Montana, is there's a lot of perceptions from hunters about impacts to big <coughs> game hunting. And whether it's real or not, people believe it. And the hunters, mostly in Montana that I talk with, hate wolves. And I think we could do a lot to dispel that. If they knew more about the science, we did better outreach, and we're all working on that here. This is a huge human dimensions problem. And that would be my advice to you, is really get out in front of this in, in uh, Colorado. There's lots of ways to monitor wolves with DNA. You don't have to collar them. Um, you have to think long and hard how you're going to pay for monitoring your wolves. Is the burden going to be on the, on the hunters? Is it going to be on the livestock industry? These are things you have to really get in line. A um, couple of bullet points for the differences with natural recolonization and reintroduction. Your natural recolonization is already happening. It's free. And I can tell you from a long history, the social acceptance of wolves that have tiptoed down by themselves is a lot higher than reintroduced wolves. And Mike may disagree with me, but I've lived this for 40 years and I can tell you that's a fact. Um, the other benefit to reintroduction is it's a much, much quicker recovery. It really helps jumpstart things. Um, I won't have time to talk about the super wolf. I can do that later during question and answer period. And when we started out, if wolves made it on their own, they were fully endangered. And if they were reintroduced, they were non-essential experimental. So uh, Googling along here, um, I found there were five wolves confirmed, the Colorado wolf sightings in the last 15 years that have come here on their own. These are collared animals. And if you know you've got five collared animals coming to Colorado and probably less than 5% of all the wolves out there are collared, you've got a lot of wolves that are making it to Colorado though they're just not all detected. So the most recent one is this one in this photo. It was detected in July uh, near Fort Collins. And as far as I know, it's still out there. It's a collared wolf from Wyoming. <coughs> so in conclusion, I'm doing well on my time? One minute. One minute, I like it. So the, the take home message on this, I don't <coughs> care if it's wolves, grizzly bears, or whatever, but wolves especially, how do we create social tolerance? And Hillary signed it, it's really summed it up well with her grizzly bear talk this morning when she said, you know, I don't get it. We had three guys mauled by a bear last week, three elk hunters, and they periodically killed people, but why don't people hate bears the way they hate wolves? And I have to ask that question a lot. Now, why aren't people afraid of mountain lions when there's three times as many mountain lions on the landscape as there are wolves? And they attack and kill people. But these are the kind of myths that in this room we all need to work on together. And that's kind of the science behind what happened in wolf recovery in Montana. 
and I hope that helps lend some insights into potential for what we can do in Colorado. So, thank you. <laughs>